everyone. It is five o'clock, and I think we'll get started. Um, now I have. Um, hang on here, just a sec. I have Marcus. You're here. Trey, you are here. If you could just confirm. Jim, I see you. Can confirm. I am here. Okay. Good afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon, Marcus. Are you around? I am indeed. You are indeed. All right. Excellent. Um, so um, I see Todd Wolf walking around. Um, are there other members in the audience? Any interesting people, Todd, that we should be aware of? Or Yep, I'm here. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, All right. Just to give you an overview, we have Daniela from finance, Vicki um, from HR, David Beeble from uh, DPW, Rick Nye from DPW. We have Matt and Adam from Enterprise that they'll, they'll be giving a presentation in a little, a little bit. And then we have uh, Mayor Vandersteen and then Scott and Robert for WSCS. All right, very good. Um, <clears throat> If you uh, wish to uh, join in the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, please uh, do so at this time. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United I States. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. To the flag States. of the United States of America, America and to the Republic, Republic for, which for which it stands, stands. one nation, under God, under God um, with liberty <laughs> and justice for all. I am so sorry. <laughs> you know what I mean. It isn't as if we don't say that 16,000 times in this chamber, so my apologies. Uh, Roberta, welcome. Glad to have you here. Sorry about that. Um, I need a motion to uh, approve the minutes of our February 8th meeting. Move to approve. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor state aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair votes aye. All right. This puts me in mind of uh, forgetting um, um, when Patti Smith forgot the words of Bob Dylan's song at the uh, Nobel uh, uh, Prize ceremony. Okay, having put that into context, 3.1 is a summons and complaint in the matter of Roswitha Bott versus the Plan Commission. Um, this is on the agenda again, Chuck. It's there because you can file the uh, uh, matter has been dismissed with uh, prejudice by the uh, by the plaintiffs. All right, very good. Is there a motion to uh, file? Move to file. Can I understand what prejudice means, though? I do, I I was just going to ask that. Well, let's get a second, and then we'll second. enjoy uh, Chuck's wisdom. Second. All right, Chuck, would you explain what with prejudice means? Yeah, with prejudice means they can't bring it back. Um, it's <clears throat> done and over with, and uh, it's as if they lost the case because they did. All right. And it was the plaintiff's motion? Yeah, it was the plaintiff's motion. We, yeah, in essence, what happened is they, they called me um, – the day after our brief was filed with the court and asked if we would be okay with them dismissing and dismissing without or with prejudice. And obviously the answer to that was yes, I'm okay with that. Sure. All right. Any other questions? Hearing none. I am sorry, I am frozen up here yet again. So I am asking for a vote uh, to uh, on the motion to file. All in favor, state aye. 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 All right. Sorry, I restarted my router and Marcus, moved, so I thought um, I would be done with this, but apparently not. Can you all understand me? Yes. Was there a me? motion made, yes. Mary Lynn? Okay, very good. 
Mary Lynn, who made the motion? Marcus so made the motion. Marcus, did you make the motion to file? Yep, and Roberta seconded. Roberta seconded. seconded. Thank you. All right. Um, 3.2 and 3.5, I think we can take together. Uh, Todd, I assume that's yours. Um, Mary Lynn. With uh, respect to the long term financial plan of the city. Yes, that we are putting through the same three point for on 3.2. We're putting through the 2021 long term financial plan for the Common Council, and it has the updated dates accordingly. All right, and then Bert, you look frustrated. Well, I, I can you hear me? Yep, okay, because I lost the picture, I lost the yeah. But okay, if you can hear me and can you see me? Yeah, and we can see you. Perfect. I won't worry, but I've got a white screen. All right. All right. We can see your new background, so it's very nice. Yes. Yes. Um. So um, I think uh, Chuck, unless there's an objection, I would ask for a uh, motion to uh, approve the resolution, and then we can discuss the matter. Move to approve. And to file the RO and approve the resolution is what you're saying? Yes, yeah, I move to approve the RO and approve the resolution. Second. If there was, all right, thank you. Um, Todd, do you want to uh, tell us what we're voting on here, please? Um, are you referencing 3.2 or are you on to 3.3 now? No, 3.2 and 3.5. Well, those are two different items. Yeah, they're a different item. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. Excuse me. The three oh, points. You're, just, totally dealing with, if you're three. just dealing with 3.2. It would be a motion to receive and file the RO. I'm sorry. Um, <coughs> and is there such a motion? My apologies, everyone. I move to do just that. <laughs> All right. And is there a second? Second. All right. And uh, Todd, uh, with respect to the long-term financial plan, I've been in too many Zoom meetings today, I'm afraid. With respect to the long-term financial plan, do you have comments? Yes, I do. Um, when I, when uh, Carrie and I first started looking at the long-term financial plan, we decided to ad adopt basically the same plan that we had last year only because at this time um, it references our strategic planning and process and goals. And right now we are pretty much rolling over um, the strategic plan from you know, 2020 to 2021. So it did not make, um, make a difference that we would make any changes at this time because it will reference our strategic planning for, um, in 2022 um, process. So the plan that you have in front of you is basically a rollover from last year. Uh, questions for Todd? Uh, uh, I have one, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Todd, uh, I read this over and you said you're, you may make some changes in, 20, for the, in 2022. Uh, any anticipation as to what some of those may be? What areas? Um, Basically, when we talk about the long-term financial plan for the, uh, to the Common Council, um, when I first looked it over, uh, I started finding that there were a lot of areas that I wanted to address, but time of the essence, I don't have the time to do that. Um, also, the fact that we know that in 2022 um, and 2023 and so forth, we're going to have some strategic um, opportunities for improvement. I felt that keeping the, the long-term financial plan as, as it's stated because the 2021 uh, budget is in process. It doesn't, make, uh, it doesn't need to be addressed at this time. In 2022, the financial plan as well as the strategic planning, uh, that'll all be under review and you'll see some additional um, changes because there's going to be more strategic planning, um, not just from a roads, but also from a facility and also um, my number one concern, which is our employees, and that'll, um, that will 
that'll be wrapped into our long-term planning is how are we going to um, better <coughs> provide the resources and planning um, for CIP and things like that in the future. So the long-term financial plan outline is going to change quite a bit in the future um, from my perspective. I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Pat. Um, I would add in reviewing the plan, um, which is, is similar to, to previous plans that we've, that we've had, um, the necessity for our council and our city government to continue to lobby the legislature for more realistic, uh, number one, amounts of shared revenue, and number two, um, modifications to the tax levy that uh, review or revise the concept of net new construction, I think is it continues to be very, very, very important. Um, the, the financial constraints placed on the city by the state certainly have a place and make sense, but at a certain point, they don't make sense anymore because it makes um, the continuing viability and uh, thriving of uh, local municipalities much more difficult. Now, that's just an editorial comment on my part, but I think if you review the long-term financial plan, you see um, how critical those areas of, um, of, of revenue are for us. And I'm pleased that at least there's a, an initial plan to um, increase uh, municipalities' share of shared revenue to some extent. Uh, what will happen, of course, is unknown at this point, but I just wanted to uh, indicate that I felt that that is quite important. Are there other comments, questions? Just to follow up on what you said, Madam Chair, I, I saw in the, uh, the our, you, our weekly uh, blurb from the League of Municipalities as part of the governor's budget, he was proposing uh, for cities of over 30,000 in population uh, to have a referendum to raise the sales tax by an extra half percent but then later, having uh, having the news on later today, I found that the Republican legislature com uh, considers that dead on arrival. Uh, I thought it possibly would have been a good idea had it, you know, and let the let the taxpayers decide it by going to referendum. Uh, I don't think I would have approved it just a, a law without a referendum. But According to what I heard today, now it's dead on arrival. So it looks like, from a sales tax standpoint, we'll be staying where we are, unless there is some future compromise this year during the budget process. Very true. <clears throat> yes, uh, increases in shared revenue and modifications of the um, tax levy limits are, <laughs> are probably not real realistic. But you know, we can always hope. The voice of the people and so forth. Any other comments? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion, please state aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair votes aye. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to 3.3, .3, um, which is an analysis of the Motor Vehicle Division um, proposal with respect to non-commercial driver's license vehicles. Um, Chair? And I see that we have folks from DPW, so I will- Chair? The... Yes. This is Todd. If I can start it, and then I'll, I'll hand the baton to, to David. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, committee, I'd, I'd like to kind of um, introduce this this program, I, I'm really excited about this. I know that David is and team are very excited about this. Um, if you remember back when I gave the state of the city, my number two area that needs um, review, um, obviously f number four was uh, roads, number three was facilities, number two was fleet, and number one was our, our most important asset, and that's our employees. This program, uh, I'm excited to present with David and his team um, and the enterprise group is 
really the ticket that we need to move forward and not only save the, the city money, but also provide an opportunity to provide our employees with uh, new equipment every couple of years. And again, please remember what I said first, save the, comp save the city money. Uh, we are looking that this will actually fold into our motor vehicle um, program, and it's going to be a really good thing from a safety perspective as well as um, providing us with savings year over year. So there are multiple uh, cities, uh, not just statewide, but throughout the United States that are using this program. And, I, and David and I are proud to present this to you guys for review. And then we're also going to present this to Public Works for review. And we're hoping that uh, both committees will uh, um, approve this and uh, promote this to actually uh, take it further um, as far as uh, with, with Chuck and his team's review of the contract and uh, approve it in council. So from there, um, David Beeble, would you like to add to that at all? I think what we need, Todd and David, is just a bit basic explanation of what the program is. I assume that's what David's going to do. Yep. Sure, Madam Chair. And <laughs> thank you. And, and, and I, I just want to echo and, and thank City Administrator Wolf for, for bringing this uh, to the committees and uh, sharing this information and introducing us to the, the team that will speak this evening. Uh, mainly, it's, it's, it's going to deal with what we call our light duty uh, portion of the fleet. It's not the entire fleet that we're talking about. It would be our pickup trucks and that would be half ton, three quarter ton, and all the way up to one ton, which is roughly about 58, 54 pieces of equipment of the fleet, which we have you know, probably 300 different types of ve uh, vehicles as well as small equipment, hand tools, uh, anything that operates with gas, gas engine. Uh, nevertheless, uh, as we mentioned, this, is, this deals with that, that portion of the fleet. And what's exciting is, is that we, we've been uh, borrowing funding for vehicle acquisition for, for many years uh, as a result of the, the motor vehicle fund, several years, almost probably over a decade now in the past where uh, that fund was used for another uh, purpose when uh, we had uh, some financial difficulties in terms of budgeting. Nevertheless, th where we're at today is uh, with roughly about a quarter, quarter million is being uh, used as borrowing. Uh, with this program, it offers an alternative to, to lease this portion of the fleet, but provides a quicker turnaround and management of that portion of the fleet. Uh, currently, this portion of our fleet that we have in stock is roughly almost the average age is 12 years old. With enterprise fleet management system, that's going to roughly go down to about three years. Uh, so it's a much quicker turnaround, capturing that higher resale value and, and using our purchasing power as a government agency in, in the resale market. There's a market for these types of vehicles at a much higher resale value than we're currently getting. And therefore, this becomes a much, much more lucrative and financial incentive for us to partner with. Um, you may have heard us talk about leasing fleets in the past. That was more just a financing mechanism where a, a leasing company would come in and finance your entire fleet and purchase. So it was just more, more of a financial exercise. This what I would consider is, although there's a, there's a financial component of it, this is more of a management program as well. And I think what you'll see tonight with the presentation is that this is an area of the fleet that, um, as you can imagine, it, it, it gets pushed off with our priorities because we're so focused on our heavy equipment, our, 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 our meat and potatoes portion of the fleet, our, our snowplow trucks, our excavators, our end loaders, high, high ticket type of uh, equipment that we need every day in the city to, to, to function properly. So, I'm excited to, to have uh, them present this evening. Uh, the numbers look great. Uh, Rick, our motor vehicle superintendent, has reviewed much of the facts and figures with this presentation and 
very impressed with this, the team as their numbers are, are right on. They're, they're uh, right worth our numbers. So it, it, it's, it's coming to fruition and I'd like to just turn it over and have the presentation. Good evening everyone, council members, city administrator Todd, thank you for the opportunity here. Um, I'll introduce myself, I'm Matt Jaskowiak with Enterprise Fleet Management. Uh, I've been with Enterprise for now 10 years. Uh, my primary role is to seek and bring on new business from a new business development standpoint. And so that's what Todd and his team and myself have done so far. I have Adam Weber with me today. He's a dedicated account manager. He actually actively manages the city of Manitowoc, city of West Bend, and city of Two Rivers as a few examples. So he would be the city's dedicated account management team. Uh, so he has himself plus a few other uh, representatives that help him and his internal team to manage his, his book of clients. So very ex uh, very, uh, very much an expert in the government sector, fleet management obviously, um, but he would be the dedicated account rep for the city. So what I'd like to do is um, continue off what Todd and David have already started, just share some of the highlights of what we found, some of the opportunities with enterprise and what that looks like financially, and then kind of give some of the supporting evidence and then leave it open for questions and answers. So the current state, um, and I believe most council members should have some of this information already, so I'll just go through and abbreviate most of it. So the current situation is the fleet consists of roughly 59 non-CDL vehicles, so that would be under the 26,000 pound requirement. 64% of that light duty fleet is roughly 10 years or older. The average age, like David said, is 12.3 years old. The average cycle for that, six, that 60 vehicle fleet is roughly 20 years. So it take the city 20 total years to consistently cycle through all 59 vehicles at the current pace. Um, so that's roughly three vehicles or so per year that the city averages um, to acquire. Out of those 59 vehicles, there are 18 different vehicle types. So myself, Adam, and David and his team will actually sit down and actively build the right spec for the right application which will minimize that number significantly, hopefully to actually single digits. So it'll create uniformity, um, better communication flow. Um, everyone has similar products and, and for, the, for, for the same in different applications and vehicles can be um, more recognizable essentially too. So the objectives were really when we sat down with Todd and his team were to really identify a fleet solution that obviously brought a financial position um, that bettered the city operationally supported uh, the staff and administratively helped the flow and the workflow. So basically what we're showing is that we're gonna show with supporting data that we're gonna move the city from a 20 year average life cycle to a three year average life cycle. By doing so, we're significantly reducing the cost of maintenance, so downtime, parts and labor, uh, and so on and so forth, about 64%. By having the new vehicles, um, on the road at the city of Sheboygan, we're gonna see roughly a 20% increase in just improving fuel economy, not alone um, and not referencing anything regards to the carbon footprint improvement as well. Some of the additional benefits are improved safety and risk like city administrator Todd mentioned, less downtime for city mechanics to really focus on higher priced items and different tasks at hand, replacing vehicles a little more frequently uh, is the most cost effective way so Adam will be dedicated to helping fleet plan year in and year out, showing you different ways to cycle through different types of vehicles at different parts of the year and different parts of each vehicle's life. So it's not just a, everything happens at the same time of year, it's a little bit different by the vehicle and by the time of year. So when we put all that together and some of the supporting data and evidence, here are the highlighted results that we found. So some of the major financial findings is over the next 10 years, the city should see a savings of anywhere 800 to a million dollars in savings, so 800,000 to about a million dollars in savings. That variance is there because it just simply depends on the vehicle types. Um, that number includes selling current assets, so the current 59 vehicles that the city has today, um, selling leased vehicles through those 10 years, so periodically we're cycling out those leased vehicles as well. The maintenance savings and the fuel savings combined is how we get that variance number. Now within that number, from years six through 10 out of that 10 year span, we're gonna see a sustainable savings on this program in doing so of roughly 40 to $64,000 every single year compared to what the city is currently actively doing today. So we'll show uh, some significant, or we'll show some supporting evidence just below here to show you where that, those numbers are coming from. 
Um, over those 10 years, out of that 800 to a million dollars in savings, $385,000 will be coming from just hard dollar maintenance costs uh, improvements, as well as $100,000 in fuel savings. Again, these numbers don't re reflect anything as far as administrative benefits that Adam and my team and enterprise as a whole will bring to the city um, or any productivity improvements as well. This is on the screen here you're gonna see is a fleet profile. I believe council members should have these numbers and I, it might look a little small on the screen, but um, what you're gonna see on the left, reading it like a book left to right, is you're gonna see the fleet profile by vehicle type, the number of vehicles per that type, the average age of each vehicle type, and the annual uh, expected mileage by each vehicle type. So we have a total of 59 vehicles, the average age is 12.3 years, so that's where we got some of those figures from before. And on average, each vehicle travels about 4,000 miles per year on average. Again, attached here is also the city of Sheboygan's fleet list. It's sorted by department. Also includes information like VIN number, year, make, model, the current odometer on the vehicles, and a sight unseen value of each vehicle assessed from Enterprise's dedicated fleet strategy manager. Uh, that person is Scott Pilzinski. He uh, is solely dedicated on just selling our off leased and client owned vehicles. So he uh, does this for a living and um, puts some conservative sight unseen values on this entire fleet. So the fleet is roughly worth just over half a million dollars in total. Again, going on to some more supportive evidence, this is a 10 year cash flow that um, Enterprise was able to, to compile with all the data and information from the city. So again, if we read it top to bottom, left to right like a book, um, I'm gonna go through some just significant numbers and then we'll just talk more in highlight. Um, so again, starting at the top, 59 vehicles, the current life cycle is that 20 mark, so 19.67 years. The average maintenance spend on the fleet is roughly $84.50 per month per vehicle. Uh, roughly 25 cents a mile is what the math comes to. We're proposing from Enterprise that same 59 number, uh, number of vehicles running at about 2.8 year pace, so about a three year life cycle. Our proposed maintenance, um, and we'll talk a little bit more of that in detail, is roughly $30 per month per vehicle. So we're shaving that down again about 60 some percent. So when we look at this analysis, the, the dark orange highlighted line is essentially the average spend per year uh, that the city is actively seeing today. So three acquisitions per year, the annual needs is 3.0. That the city is spending roughly 115 or 113,000 or so dollars on acquisitions, roughly $60,000 per year on maintenance, $47,000 a year in fuel cost, which gives the city a grand total on average per year, about $220,000 of net spend for their fleet on these 59 vehicles. So this analysis, as you see, there's, there's 10 years in total that accumulate lease payments, um, equity from current owned vehicles and enterprise leased vehicles. It's gonna show an overview of maintenance spend each year, fuel spend, and a total fleet budget. So as you see the net cash column on the very far right, that number is showing our figure from enterprise from years 2021 through 2030 is taking our total number minus the $220,403 number the city established, that we established as the city's average annual budget. So for example, if we took a negative $211,231 and subtract the difference of $220,000 positive dollars, we're getting a net cash difference of $431,000 in comparison to what the city is spending today versus what the city would actually spend cash out, cash in in year one with enterprise. We are looking at replacing all the vehicles right away in year one, so you're gonna see a significant um, cash flow difference in, in the first few years. And the sustainable savings that you see in the bottom right, which is 39,292, you will see that number is sustainable savings after years six through 10 to show the city that this program is not only financially lucrative in the beginning years, but it also is sustainable. The other column I'll say uh, real quick before we move forward is the highlighted column in the middle of the screen, the total capital outlay. So if we added up A plus B equals C, so the lease payments minus any equity coming in, so just capital budget, not talking about maintenance or fuel, the next 10 years, the average capital budget for the city will be just, just under $82,000 to support this program. In comparison, we're flipping all vehicles right away in year one and constantly every three years on average. And when we compare that $82,000 uh, average capital budget spend, to the city's current $113,000 capital spend, 
we're talking about 50, 59 total vehicles. If you take 10 times three is 30 total vehicles over 10 years. So we're doing this for less per year on double the amount of vehicles compared to what the city's spending today on um, only 30 vehicles in 10 total years. Below you will see uh, multiple examples of uh, just supporting evidence that illustrate where the figures in dollars and cents are coming from. So we have a uh, breakdown of vehicle types, we have a breakdown of um, uh, lease payments and capitalized price with vehicles and aftermarket costs capped into certain specific vehicles to really show what would year one look like as far as um, a starting point. And then also I established and built a fixed budget for the city to adopt financial practices and accounting rules. The government entity would have to assess this process on their own internally. Essentially it's a way to build an equity reserve fund internally to assess equity to pay off any lease costs for the program. And what you're gonna see if you again read it left to right like a book over time, if with a fixed $125,000 budget for the city, we will have, uh, the budget is fixed so it doesn't go up but doesn't go down. Every year if the city applies the amount of equity needed to get to that specific budget, they will actually have a $430,000 surplus at the end of the 10th year still in that reserve to support this program. So there's some method behind the madness on how we get to the 125 and I can explain that in greater detail, uh, but that's a way for the city to not have to pay any more or any less for all straight 10 years. So with that, I will yield back and answer any questions anyone has. Uh, below there's more supporting evidence, what Adam does with his um, account management team, the technology, the city and staff would actually receive, which is um, a huge part of what we do. And some other references and clients that we work with, with contact information and so on and so forth. So I want to thank you, Todd, and everyone for their time today, and I will certainly answer any questions I can. Questions for the gentleman? Marcus. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I've got a couple of questions um, about this uh, chart on page what would be the 10-year cash flow three-year cycle sheet page six of this document um i'm having a little bit of trouble understanding the fuel cost and how you're going to keep fuel fixed for the next 10 years we all know that fuel fluctuates where is inflation in this where's inflation in let's just start with fuel and then we'll go from there Great question. So uh, there is no inflation throughout this entire analysis just because it's somewhat unpredictable in some states because the fuel again is it can go up, it can go down. So we feel that it's more or less just better to keep it as a constant. Um, and then it's just the same across the board. So again, there's going to be some variability, but with increased vehicle cost comes increased resale values. So a lot of times it's just kind of putting inflation in for almost no apparent reason. So what we do is we just keep everything pretty constant. Um, ideally, there's gonna be some inflation over the next 10 years, but some, in some regards, unpredictable. Thank you. Madam Chair, I've got a couple of follow-up questions. Do you mind sure. if I go off? Thank you. Uh, when it comes to the proposed maintenance number of $30.01, how did you arrive at that? Can you give me the background on that one? Yes, so that is a fixed maintenance program. So the idea would be to outsource the maintenance needed for our vehicle program to local vendors and taxpayers, which is obviously a great opportunity to support your local constituents. Um, so essentially that number derives from an algorithm that Enterprise generates based on vehicle type, the term that associates with each vehicle. So is it a, are we keeping it one years, two years, three years, five years, whatever it might be, and then the annual mileage associated with that. So it's a fixed algorithm based on many different factors uh, that covers all major minor repairs, including oil changes, tire rotations, engines, transmissions, wiper blades, uh, fuses. We have the ability to even cap in uh, brakes and tires if need be, just not a very popular item um, and not needed item on a fleet of, that, of three years old in a government municipality. So that's an outsourced program. So that's the only way we could truly give the city a fixed cost. So that number is a fixed cost based on the vehicle types given and the mileages and the terms associated with each vehicle type. Madam Chair, this next question might be best served by uh, the Director of Public Works. Um, if we're having such great savings and then outsourcing this to private citizens, how many people are we getting rid of in the maintenance department for vehicles? Actually, I'd like to jump in on that also, and, and David can follow up. Um, 
uh, Marcus, I guess one of the things that I would like to point out, and Rick and I can, uh, can also jump in, um, right now our 60 or, or 58 to 59 assets are not maintenanced um, because of the present uh, present level of resources that we have. I mean, we maintenance them to the best of our ability, but as uh, Director Beeble had uh, pointed out earlier, uh, a lot of our resources are used on our larger equipments, you know, our, like right now our snow plows that are out on the streets, our garbage trucks that are out on the streets on a day-to-day -day basis. But when it comes to our lighter utility vehicles, they tend to get the, the you know, the short end of the, of the uh, schedule, if you know what I mean. Um, one of the things I did want to point out, though, with this program is please remember that the lifespan of these vehicles are going to be between one and three, maybe five years on the, on the high end, depending on value. So that means that the only maintenance that's really going to be needed from an outsource perspective would be either warranty work and or uh, oil changes and tire rotations. Now, because of the fact that the lighter duty vehicles don't have that many miles on them, I mean, even rotating tires would be on the edge of the spectrum versus, you know, annually. So that takes a lot of the, um, the, the maintenance that our team handles right now and allows them to focus on our heavy duty equipment that really needs um, that focus from a day-to-day -day perspective. I hope that helps you. David, do you have anything to add? Yes, I would, Ms. Madam Chair. Um, quite frankly, we're actually short a person in the in the Department of Public Works meet, uh, Motor Vehicle Division. We've been operating for several years uh, understaffed, especially when you factor in that we took on the fire or all the fire department's equipment. Uh, when, their, when their mechanic retired, that position wasn't transferred to our department, and uh, that position was then created into another firefighter instead of a mechanic in the fire department. As City Administrator Wolf alluded to, uh, this area of the fleet is probably the under-maintenanced under uh, fleet, unfortunately, and that's why we just hang on to stuff for as long as we do. Um, and this significantly will help us focus on, as I mentioned earlier, I would say our, our, our much larger capitalized uh, vehicles and equipment such as our tandem and triaxles, our paver, our, our end loaders. Uh, you're talking some of that pieces of equipment can reach up to a half a million dollars and our mechanics are focused on that on a daily basis. I also wanted to point Marcus? out, Madam Chair, that the, the, the safety of the new equipment compared to the older equipment that we have, um, if you look at our 20 year average replacement and then you look at our geo debt, um, we're literally financing equipment at a with a 10 year payback or payoff term, but we're not, we're not uh, replacing them for 20 years. So um, obviously the, 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 the care and, and technology of the older equipment um, from a safety perspective is not to the level that it should be for a city. Thank you. Marcus, is that it or do you have other questions? One simple final question. What is the new MPG that we're going to be expected out of this fleet? Yeah, it's, all, it's, a, it's a good question. And again, fuel is going to be the biggest variable because of driver behavior, um, cost of fuel, of course. But, you know, in our analysis, we're assuming two to three mile per gallon increases. You can see we're only netting about a $10,000 fuel savings every year. So if you think of the magnitude of, of cycling out a you know, 12 year old fleet for a brand new fleet day one, you know, my money is definitely on the newer fleet of improved fuel economy. So that's roughly what we see. So a lot of it's predicated on uh, fuel cost per gallon as well as um, driver behavior mostly. So again, it's not, a, if we took fuel completely out, it wouldn't move this analysis that drastic over 10 years. Um, it's still going to be a huge win. It's just we want to account for a little bit because the city will see not only fuel savings, miles per gallon increase, but the other you know big topic is the carbon footprint side of things. It's obviously going to improve the amount of carbon footprint, the carbon footprint the city has by just having more fuel efficient vehicles, even in obviously they're gas run powered vehicles, but the pounds that they put out is much different than your current fleet today. Okay, Bert. Um, thank you. Um, 
when when I take my car in for maintenance and I get my bill, I see parts and labor. And we we talked about the labor portion. Am I understanding that nobody's going to be laid off and and if we have a transition out we may see we may save a position if somebody retires. Net will we will we keep our maintenance staff the same? Will it need to be increased? Will that position that was replaced in the fire department where are we with maintenance? Where are we with the maintenance staff? If we're going to save that much on maintenance, where are we? Roberta, um, what I what I would would be stating at this time is that, um, as David had had presented, we're actually short in the in our maintenance department at DPW. But I can say that moving forward, that throughout the city, we'll be reviewing all departments um, for for the level of of support that we need for resources, and that that position, these positions, right now we're looking at trying to save the money right now, and get the appropriate level of resources to our larger assets, as David had said. David, yeah, and and, and roughly what this portion in the maintenance that we're talking about is roughly 700 hours total. So it doesn't even equal a full-time position in terms of the maintenance that's required in this area. It just it comes down to what are the priorities and we have far too many priorities and not enough uh, bodies really to assign to manage the entire fleet, including the fire, fire um, apparatuses that we've taken on. So this will, by, by shifting this burden from us, we not only do we save financially, but it also we gain hours back into areas of the fleet that we're not able to spend today. Thank you. I've got a couple, Madam Chair. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, this is, I believe, this would be for the gentleman from Enterprise. Uh, I noticed in the uh, in the referral you gave of Wausau, if I read it correctly, they're on a four-year replacement. Uh, schedule is that correct? That is correct. And uh, you listed a great, uh, great number of municipalities uh, that are in this program. Uh, what percentage uh, are going with the three-year program as you're proposing for us, or the four, like Wausau, or any other length of time? What is it, what are most of the municip municipalities doing? Yeah, it, it's good. Great question. It's um, it's an evolving sector of our business. So it's the fastest growing sector of enterprise over the last three or four years. And what we've witnessed, the, the truth behind the data is exactly what these municipalities are taking advantage of. So you can expect municipalities similar size around the area, just for reference, are on anywhere, you know, between that three and five year life cycle. So um, some vehicles are going to be less, and some might be a little bit longer. Um, you don't operate a one-ton dump body with a plow and salter on the back the same way you operate a half-ton pickup truck. They're all different. They're completely different DNA-style vehicles. You buy, they're, they're sold different. They're operated different. The, re, the resale market's different. So each vehicle class will have its own length of time or, or, or an, a set opportunity of time. Um, nothing's set in stone, but that's what Adam will be doing with the city. He'll constantly be working with the decision makers here to showcase different ways to cycle out and save money, replace vehicles or hold vehicles. So you can expect most municipalities that are, are buying into the program 100%, like the city of Sheboygan has th so far, are actively doing what we are showcasing today. Uh, another question is the, the majority of the vehicles, the non-CDL vehicles that we'll be getting from Enterprise uh, what are the factory warranties on those? Are they similar to a car three-year 36, where then I could see the advantage of a, of a three-year program so that the maintenance all, would, all for the duration would be, would be covered by a factory warranty and all we would be responsible for would be the cost of the minor stuff, the oil changes, et cetera? Yep, great point. So in, in the fleet government world, most... Uh, in this case, this example showcases all vehicles will still be under factory warranty. So usually it's a five-year, 60,000-mile powertrain. 
and in some cases it's a five year 100,000 mile powertrain for fleet vehicles. Um, obviously the city is not gonna experience any five year old 100,000 mile vehicles uh, unless they're traveling significantly differently than what the data shows. Um, but you're exactly right, the warranties would, your local vendors would be able to support the warranty work at hand in turn as well as do the minor preventative, non-preventative maintenance uh, repairs as well. And one final one, uh, what would be the, uh, uh, the additional revenue we would get uh, trading in a three-year-old vehicle versus some, you know, for example, Wausau, that's keep, keeping them four years. Is it an additional 10% on, on, on trade-in value, or can you give us some kind of an idea where the advantage would be there on trade-in? Yeah, what you're going to see over probably the next 12 months to 48 months is the city of Wausau's average age will start to slowly go down. Um, over the last three or four years, they've been with a client for us for almost five or six years. And so really the government world and enterprise when it really took off around the country really started more everything on a five year cycle. But what we found and what Adam's experienced with some of his government clients is we're seeing a lower cost of ownership on a vehicle as a whole anywhere between one year old to three years old um, than it would be on four or five. So again, it just really depends on the vehicle type, the time of year, the market trends, and then Adam, if you want to say anything any further on that, that's fine too. Hello everyone, my name's Adam Weber, nice to meet you, thanks for having us. Uh, I just want to reiterate on the, the length of cycle and how that changes, especially this year, more important than ever. Um, through the pandemic with the manufacturer shutting down for close to four months and the delays of all the vehicles coming in, the resale market right now is currently a 15 year high Specifically, the segment of cargo vans and pickup trucks is the highest return on your resale of any other manufactured vehicle out there today. So right now we're in a perfect storm where that resale value is higher than ever. And the, in the government space, the vehicles that come to the secondary market, um, that is unique inventory when you come across a one-year vehicle at 6,000 miles or a two-year vehicle at 12,000 miles and then a three-year vehicle, say, at 15, 16,000 miles. We are selling those vehicles for as much as you bought them for, if not in some cases even more. So there's examples now where vehicles are being acquired and within 12 months we're selling that vehicle for more than you pay for in the government space. So that's where the impact is. The resale market continues to stay high this year. There will be a slight decline, but it's so exaggerated and amplified this year that taking advantage of this program this year, um, I think is gonna be very impactful to the city, um, but that's where Enterprise really based their business model is selling vehicles. They sell all these rental vehicles across the country directly to the dealerships, and that's how we return the best return back to our clients. So that's really where the magic of the program will work for you folks. I have one more question, Madam Chair. This one's for uh, David Beeble. <clears throat> Go ahead. Uh, David, when you're going out uh, and looking for somebody to do the maintenance, whether it be a Sheboygan Chevrolet or Van Horn Chevrolet, if they happen to be a GM vehicles, uh, I would imagine one of the things you're going to be asking them is when you bring in these vehicles, what the turnaround time is going to be on maintenance because you will not be able to be able to have these things out of service for very long. And I, and, and I imagine there's going to be somebody in your department that's going to have to be uh, kind of the person that is going to have to uh, be in charge of maintenance and seeing that we they go in and we get them back in a reasonable amount of time. And I think we're going to need those assurances from the dealership that you select. Uh, that's correct. We, we've been talking already internally, uh, Rick, with motor vehicle or supervisor and, and uh, in terms of how that would be managed, it would be a partnership with enterprise, we track this, we'd have that communication. We do some of that today uh, with some of our vehicles, there are newer vehicles for instance, uh, but, but it's manageable and we think again uh, that it wouldn't be all, we wouldn't have like 10 of these out at this, all at the same time. There would be a cycle, there'd be a process and there'd be a constant ebb and flow of, of, of vehicles being maintained in this manner. Thank you. Uh, one more for Todd, if I could. Uh, Todd, uh, are any of the uh, police squad cars and the, you know, the smaller vehicles, that type of thing, 
uh, is it a possibility to uh, uh, to get those types of vehicles in this program? Yes, it is. And we actually talked about that quite in depth uh, in the very beginning when Matt and I first met and talked. Um, it, it will not include ambulances and things like that, but it would, and if you remember, uh, we just received two uh, police squads recently, and that was about a $74,000 ticket item that we had on our CIP. So again, if we can get these into rotation in the future, uh, that's gonna save us a lot of money and it's also gonna free up uh, capital improvements um, dollars so that we can use those funds for either reduction of uh, borrowing and or an, um, additional projects for the future. Good question, thank, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, just let me say that um, uh, I wanna thank you, uh, Todd uh, for and David for your work on this. I think this is innovative, imaginative, and um, really a, uh, a credit to how the city is doing business in, uh, I guess what I would call the modern world. Uh, but uh, in any event, I think it, uh, I think it is uh, an excellent program. And with respect to that, then I would ask for a motion to um, uh, recommend that the council move forward with entering into this lease agreement with Enterpri Enterprise, excuse me, fleet management. So move, Warren. Second. All right, moved by Jim, seconded by Marcus. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor state aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair votes aye. All right, very good. Um, Moving to uh, 3.4, which is a resolution providing for the sale of approximately $3,660,000 in taxable general obligation uh, refunding bonds, uh, series 2021B. Who would like to take that? There's Carol. Hello, good evening. Okay. Thomas turned on his camera, so I thought, oh, well, <laughs> but in any event, go ahead, Carol. Okay, thank you. All right, I did prepare a report for you tonight as well. And uh, I see I am uh, a presenter here, which uh, um, I can uh, click on the presenter screen and I'm not quite sure what, what's going to happen, <laughs> but, uh, but I will try. <laughs> so, okay, so we will try it. So here we go. <laughs> Okay. All right. All right. So with that, this is a set sale resolution. And we talked about a set sale resolution at your last meeting, and this is prepared in the exact same format. This is for uh, $3,660,000 of what's called taxable general obligation refunding bonds. And that's driven by the purpose, which I will get into with you. And this is to be sold at a future date, and this date would coincide with the same date as the city would sell its capital improvement program note. So we would do the same thing, prepare official notice of sale, official statement, um, and uh, come back to the council on March 15th after bids are open and uh, for the adoption of a what's called an award resolution at that time. And uh, now I would like to get into the purpose of the issuance itself. And this is a new topic, uh, it's called advanced refunding. And advanced refunding is a type of refinancing. The most common type of refinancing that we work with is called the current refunding where the city borrows money and pays off the existing debt within a relatively short period of time. Advanced refunding is a type of refinancing that the city con considers when the existing debt is not at its prepayment date. The prepayment date is, is referred to as the call date. So the federal government has allowed municipalities to use the tool of advanced refunding, and what happens in that scenario is the city does borrow the money, 
and purchases investments that are issued through the U.S. Treasury. Matter of fact, they're called SLUGs, State and Local Government Series. And those investments are matched to the payment of the existing debt. So therefore, what's happening is the bondholders of your existing debt continue to get their interest payment until that call date, because that's what they are promised at the time of the issuance of that existing debt. So these U.S. Treasuries are purchased and put into an escrow, and the escrow agent then is responsible for paying off the existing debt. So the city basically walks away from that existing debt. It comes off your legal debt limit as well. Okay, so that's the concept of advanced refunding. You are refinancing in advance of the call date, but the debt will be called in escrow at that call date. So we're only building the escrow to the call date. Okay, so refunding itself is basically used for two different reasons. One is to realize savings. The other is to restructure your existing debt. Okay. And because interest rates are at historical low levels, it does provide issuers uh, the opportunity to, to accomplish both goals. Now, this is a subject that the city administration and I have been reviewing since 2019. And it's really coming forward to you now because of the low interest rate environment. Matter of fact, I did a presentation back at a finance committee meeting in 2019 where we did talk about this and about this possibly happening in the future. Uh, of course, we weren't at that time expecting that we were going to be at such low interest rates as we are today. So that's the reason for us bringing it forward to you today uh, before that we thought we would be coming to you in a, in a couple of years from now. So the city has, for, to fund its capital improvement plan, the city has traditionally used general obligation notes, and that is restricted to a maximum of 10 years. And those general obligation notes typically have a prepayment feature or a call date on the last two payments in that 10-year note. Okay, that's typically a, a structure that is favorable to the city so that it's not the city's not paying for that call feature. Um, so that's the reason why the last two principal maturities have a call fee. Now, over the last few years, as we've been reviewing the city's capital improvement plan and the needs, as well as projecting out future issues, there is the concern came with the impact of the combined annual debt service on the tax levy was significantly increasing. And, and that's why I mentioned back in 2019, we started to do this exercise back then, and we looked at what would happen going forward, and we said, you know, something's going to have to happen if, we, if these combined levels are not acceptable to the city. If they're acceptable to the city, then you don't need to do this. But if this is something that you want to accomplish, to uh, bring down that impact, then this is a tool that can accomplish that for you. So we are looking at three specific issues, a 2015 note, a portion of 2015 note, and 2017 note, okay, to manage the tax levy. And the prepayment date for those is the 2015 notes have the prepayment date in October of 22, the 16 notes is October of 23, and the 17 notes is April 1 of 2025. And the plan that was presented back in 2019 was to wait until we got to their prepayment date. Okay, we weren't thinking of doing advanced refunding, we were thinking of waiting until we got the current refunding opportunities when they were callable. So at that, that analysis said if we waited until we got to that call date, the present value of the uh, savings or cost of doing that, and in this case it would be a cost, because you're talking about stretching out the debt. 
and that was on a present value basis about a break even position. Okay, so that was the analysis done back in 2019. So now that we're in the low interest rate environment that we weren't anticipating, we said, well, what would happen if we consider doing the advance refunding at this time? and take advantage of locking in the low interest rates. Of course, when we did the analysis back in 2019, we weren't sure what the interest rates were going to be in the future, but this was giving us an, exam an opportunity to say, we know we're at historic loans, we take advantage of it and lock it in. So that, that kind of sets the stage for why we're bringing this to you now. So the next is the portion of the existing notes that we're refunding. So you can see the three issues there. You can see the principal amount, and you can see the interest rates that they're outstanding at, and then I total them up um, to the right. And keep in mind, it's the principal amount, and it's the interest to their closing, okay? Because the bondholders are still proud to get their interest on those principal amounts to their prepayment date, okay? So, all right, so that's, those are the three issues and the dollar amounts associated with them. So the, the page, this page that has the chart below here, the schedule below, shows you what if we didn't do anything. Okay, so this starts with the existing city purposes debt service. And this does not include TIF. This is only debt issued for city. All right, then moving to the right, you'll see the 4255 of the 2021 CIP notes that we talked about at your last meeting. And now we project three more financing, each for $4 million. And that's in 22, 23, and 24. And then there's the estimated combined debt service column. And you kind of go Look at that column. That's the reason why we're talking about this re advance refunding is because we're going from in 2022, which has the impact of the 2021 CIP notes, we're at $4.4 million of tax money. The next year, we go up to 4.9. That's a $488,000 increase in tax money. The next year is $578,000 increase in tax levy. And then it drops down to a $5,271,000, but it jumps back up to five million six. Now, it only drops down to five million two is because there's no principal repayment in that year 2024, which traditionally you would like to have. You would not typically want to do an issue for $4 million and pay back no principal. But that was done purposely just to give you an idea of what, what what's happening with your tax combined tax levy, taking into consideration what's already in place, what we're doing in 21, and projecting out the next three years. So this is the reason for bringing this to your attention as far as action on it now, rather than waiting into the future for whatever the markets will bear in the future. So again, at the bottom of this schedule, it goes back to now talking about this issue, the three million six sixty of taxable general obligation bonds. The process of advance refunding under federal law requires it right now to be done as a taxable. This is not a tax exempt eligible purpose. It used to be until a few years ago when federal law changed and said any advance refunding has to be done at taxable interest rates. Now, in this current environment, there is very little difference between taxable and tax exempt. But in a more traditional market, there would be a, a large difference between the two. Okay, so, so that's, that's again, uh, a factor of current uh, market. So again, we're looking at restructuring those last two years in each of those 15, 16, and 17 notes. And we're replacing it with a stretched out schedule. We're actually um, going to stretch those out between the years 24 and 2033. 
And right now, the estimated true interest rate, which, which includes all expenses, is 1.42%. And of course, the final rate won't be known until bids are taken and locked in, which is March 15th. And uh, because we're stretching debt out, we're going to be looking at a cost, not a savings. Okay? If we're, the time that we look at savings is when we are matching the same term of the financing. But in this case, if we're looking for tax levy relief, we have to stretch it out. Okay, so, so that's what's going on here. So the refunding will lower the annual tax levy requirements for city purpose debt service, and I have that example for you on another page. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that in just a moment. So the next page, and I won't go through um, a great deal of detail on here, but this is the sources and uses of funds, which basically is demonstrating that the there is a portion of the 2021 bonds attributable to each one of those three notes that we're refunding. They, the same thing is with the expenses. They're allocated between the three. The expenses are estimates at this point. And again, the final number may impact the issue size. We may have lower numbers than what we're showing you. And under uses of funds, you see it says total cost of investments for escrow. Okay, we're going to take the money, buy investments from the U.S. Treasury, and put them in escrow. The U.S. Treasury prices those investments every single day. So when we get to March 15th, we will know what the bid is from the underwriter on the borrowing side. And we also then have to go to the treasury on the same day to find out what are the rates from the U.S. Treasury on the investment side. So we're actually being impacted by two different markets. And if the borrowing side goes up, there is a usually the correlation to the investment side going up as well. <coughs> Excuse me. So, so I just wanted to make you aware of what's going on with the sources and uses of funds. This is a structure of the 3660 You'll see the principal starting in 24. And 40000 a year <coughs> for the first two years. And then it starts to increase to 70, 40, and, and <coughs> excuse me, and so on to 33. The rates are taxable, <coughs> but the uh, true interest rate of a 1.42, again, including all expenses. Okay, now, just trying to navigate down here. <laughs> um, here we go. Okay, now we're going to look at the results, but this is a paragraph that describes the results. And it's going to compare the existing debt service on those three notes to this debt service structure. And what you're going to find out is there's two numbers. One is the future value, and then we present value. Uh, we did the same analysis back in 2019. So in this case, the future value is a cost of $321,000. But present value at the cost of money today is 136. The analysis that we did back in 2019 had a future value of 500, loss of 552,000, but a present value of only 44,000. That was that break even scenario we talked about. The reason that the future value cost is lower now is because we have lower interest rates now in 21 than what we were projecting would happen in the future when you could call in those bonds. 
that's the reason why the future value is lower now. The present value is going to be higher now because we're doing it sooner. We're going to have that financing done in 2021 instead of in the future years when they were callable. So that's what affects the present value number. Okay. Okay, so now let's look at the savings comparison. So here you can see the column starts with the 21 taxable debt service that we just looked at on the previous page. And moving to the right, you can see the debt service combined on those three, three note issues. Okay. And then you'll see the column to the far right is the cost column. So the first uh, several numbers that do not have parentheses on them are savings. And then, of course, the ones with the parentheses below them is where the costs are occurring because we're obviously taking the debt out of the front end and moving the debt down to the, to the back end. Okay, so that's where the numbers are coming from. And if you look at now what, the, what it all means, okay, that here is the same schedule that we looked at before that shows but this starts with the city services debt service after this refunding, if we were to do it, as you've seen above. So this is the new column that starts off with the debt service after refunding. And then it includes the next four schedules of debt, just the same as we've seen in the before refunding. But then you can see how it rolls up on the combined column. Okay, so now your combined number from 22 to 23, right, if we're at 4,379,000 in 22, it goes to 4,492,000 in 23, and then it goes up by 285,000 in 24, and then up by 143,000 in 25 and 26, kind of your highest point. So between the two schedules, there's over $700,000 difference in your high point. Okay, so again, this would be the whole purpose of doing advanced refunding. And it's all about where you would like your, how to manage your tax levy with what's outstanding now, as well as into the future. Now, this answer after refunding does not assume that you need to refinance anything else going forward to accomplish this. You can refinance them if it makes economical sense for you to do so or if your plans change. But nothing in this scenario has been projected to do, have to do another refinancing. So if you do decide that you want to go forward with this, we would be mirroring the timeline with the uh, market preparations for the city's capital improvement plan. Everything would be done in one rating and, and official statement. And again, come back to the council. It would be a separate award resolution. Okay. And uh, on the date of closing, April 1st, what happened is that the money from the bond issue was directly to an escrow agent, which is like an um, associated trust company is an example. And that's the day where the city then uh, is no longer responsible for those payments of the debt. And the escrow agent then starts takes over with making the payments to bondholders from those investments. Okay? So I know that's a lot of information at once, so I'd be happy to uh, answer your questions. Go ahead, Bert. Um, I am I am understanding that interest rates are really low right now, so refinancing right now makes a great deal of sense. In in refunding bonds makes a great deal of sense. The implications of taking our by by escrowing some of our debt. Does it 
does it make a difference in our day-to-day -day bonding? Is, is that how, how we, our day-to-day -day levy? Does that, our year-to-year -year levy? Is, is that part of why we're doing this in addition to interest rates are really low right now? Yes, yes. Uh, what is happening is that by stretching out the debt, uh, we are removing the 2015, 16, and 17 note debt service mm -hmm. and putting it in the escrow so that we can substitute lower interest rate debt, but, by, but stretch it out longer. So it is definitely impacting your year-to-year -year levy. That, is, that would be the whole uh, goal of, of doing an advanced refunding for restructuring. Okay, and then I'm understanding that the, there is a cost for us to do this, and it's 300 plus thousand. Is that accurate? The 300 plus thousand is the cost on a uh, what's called a future value basis. So that would be page four at the at the top, where you see um, in the beginning years. Okay, there in uh, the column that's to the far right. It's uh, 35,000. That's a savings because we're removing the debt from the old issue. The next, uh, next three, four, five numbers are all in the positive. That means they're all savings numbers. That means we're taking that much debt off your levy, and that's why it's, it's a savings. But okay. if you look at the numbers below it, it all in parentheses. That's what we're putting it back on when there is no debt out there right now. So we're putting the debt in those flats. So that becomes the cost. So we call that that grand total of that column. That's this cost of 321,000. That's called a future value. And then what you do is you present value that at the cost of money over time. And that is where the present value is, it says right underneath that net present value loss. So that's 136,026. Okay. So that's taking that calculation into consideration. All right, thank you. So, Carol, my question is, because I only understood part of this, it appears that there is, um, at least for a number of years, an advantage to doing this, and then after a number of years, there's a clear disadvantage. Is that a fair statement? Um, it's in terms of when you say um, it's an advantage or disadvantage, are you referring to this uh, schedule that at the top? Right. Yeah. You know, savings versus um, increased yes. costs because we're taking yes. it out longer. Yes, that's correct. Uh, we are we are creating a savings because we're totally you know removing the debt from those years, so it looks like a savings, but it's almost like an artificial savings. But in the same sense, we're putting in debt where we're creating the cost because there is no debt in there now. So that's why we're creating a cost. So between the two of them, uh, the whole goal of this financing is only restructuring. I guess to the extent that you're stretching out existing debt and trying to minimize the cost of it, you want to do that in as low an interest rate environment as you can get because there will be a cost of stretching out debt that only went out 10 years, and now we might be going out 13 or 14 years with that original piece of debt. And so, uh, just again, so I understand, those the, that interest rate, the current interest rate, then would be locked in? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Marcus? Uh, so, uh, I, I, I guess my question is a little bit more plain English. It sounds like we're paying $136,000 in today dollars to do exactly what for the citizens of Sheboygan. Okay, what you're doing is you're managing uh, the difference of where the combined tax levy is going to go. If you were indeed to issue $4 million over these four years for capital projects, and the difference would be yeah, the, the highest point on page four, where the, um, you would look to the year 2026, 
and you're at $4.9 million. Every year your levy goes up when you issue debt. If we did absolutely, if we didn't do anything at this point, and we just went forward with the 21 CIP, then we go back to page two. Carol? Yes? This is Todd. Um, I guess another another way to help um, Marcus understand is when you when you reference the four million, that was a model that you and I put together, basically looking at the next couple of years in CIP. If we estimated at a four million dollar spend in CIP year over year, this is what it's going to look like, respectfully. What, am I correct? Can I jump I think you can add some clarity to my question then. Um, so how, how will, if we were to do this proposed thing of $4 million borrowing over the next three years in 22 through 24, uh, and our debt service goes up to the highest of 5.6 million in 2026, what would that look like to the average taxpayer in Sheboygan versus with this new plan? But, but uh, Marcus, I guess it, your question's a little bit different. The, the issue is what Carol and I are working to do is that we're trying to balance the, the cost to the levy, which allows us to, um, to manage our operating cost. Our operating cost, our revenue continues to drop. And it, we have to be very careful in the year over year of levy, of dollars going to the, from the levy to pay our operating costs, to pay our bonds. So when you look at that, that's where we're trying to um, kind of balance it year over year versus having the, those spikes that Carol showed you in, in some of those pages where it went up to like 5.9 and things like that. The city can't continue to have increases in CIP and increases in operating costs to pay the geo debt year over year when our revenues continue to decrease. Would that be correct, Carol? Yes, that would be correct. And uh, uh, one of the reasons why the existing city purposes debt does have that um, high of a, um, of a um, uh, annual combined levy is because the city does use 10-year notes to fund its CIP and the more, if you if you did that with a two and a half or three million dollar debt every year, um, you may not see those kind of spikes develop. But when you get into doing four million, five million dollars each year, uh, it becomes more and more difficult to keep that debt within a ten year amortization without that happening. I mean, your debt becomes a little bit heavy uh, with that much uh, issuance. And as you can see, even from the schedule that's up here in 22 and 23, you see how it starts off your uh, issue in 22. You're in the 250,000, 270,000, and then look at where your last two years are, where the call features are. You're in 900 and over a million dollars. See, because again, you're heavy, it's very heavy on the back end of those two years. Uh, the only way to not have that happen is to uh, issue something that would go beyond 10 years. Okay, so, so that would be the only way that you would keep those last two years from not getting to that point. So you have saved a lot of money by keeping your debt within that 10 year amortization all these years. It's just now it's getting to the point where the amount of debt that you're issuing, you can keep doing that. It's just going to put more pressure on that tax levy number. That tax levy requirement to, to tax board is going to be greater and greater every year. So it really comes down to, you know, where you, how you want to manage that levy. If that's an acceptable number to, to be at that, you know, five million six, with even this type of a structure continuing, then, then that would be what you would expect to, to happen. If you do you want to lower that number, then the advanced refunding is the tool that allows you to lower that number. And either way, you're, you're, you know, you're stretching your debt out if you refund. If you refund with advanced refunding or if you wait in the future and you do it with current refunding, the whole goal of the refunding would be to stretch it out if you do want to bring down that combined debt service number. Except 
And Todd, so what I'm trying to understand in 2028, when our borrowing costs just on, and I'm looking at page four, um, down a bit. So w what would be your plan for, um, thank you, um, 2028 all of a sudden now, um, we're losing quite a bit of money instead of saving it. Would that affect uh, borrowing capabilities in 2028? Or would you just be kind of waiting to see what would happen? Um, do you see what I'm asking? I, um, Chair, I believe I understand what you're what you're asking. I, I believe that what to answer that question is what we are planning on doing is having a better balanced balance sheet by that time. Um, right now, we're focusing on being able to to increase our operating costs so that we can afford additional debt because we know that year over year. And that's where, you know, the, the team and I, you know, Daniela and, you know, Carol, um, when, we, when we met, we talked about different models if we were to look at $3 million or $4 million of CIP. Because it's traditional that the city borrows, um, you know, in that range. And we wanted to know how is that going to affect us moving forward because we did take on some, some larger projects, as we know. But we also know that... Um, using the last couple of years as an example that we've lost and put, put the pandemic aside, we've, our, our operating costs continue to rise year over year. So obviously we can't keep increasing debt and have our revenues continue to decrease. So we're trying to balance it and then come up with a better plan moving forward and how we're going to be able to control that. So by doing what we're doing, by advancing some payments to um, pay some of this off, as Carol had talked about, looking at a model of $4 million, you saw that it actually softens the year over year of, of payments. And that's what we're recommending at this time to allow us to better review the years coming. Because we do know um, from a facilities management and obviously our roads, um, and just internal operations, there's some investment that the city's going to need to review, and we're trying to set the stage to be able to do this as, mo as best economical, best stewardship. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, and for me, it basically comes down to, um, this just intuitively doesn't make a great deal of sense to me, but I think it's because I don't really have a sense of the full picture and the forward-looking picture. Um, so from my perspective, my trust is in you and your analysis and Carol's analysis, and so I'm comfortable with this. It's just, it's, 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 it's not as um, interesting or as uh, comfortable, I guess, is the word I would be looking for as, as stuff that we've done in the past if you understand what I'm saying. Yep. Well, the, the decisions in the past right. were much easier because of the fact that we were looking at just refunding or, you know, to reduce, uh, to reduce our, um, our per, right. you know, interest per percentage. Yep. That's an easy win. Um, looking at this, when Carol and I first were looking at it, we were looking at these were items that we wanted to to, to roll in in the future, but it didn't make sense to wait for the future for the call feature. So that's why we decided to go with the taxable because the interest rates are so low, the taxable or non-taxable didn't make a, uh, a difference, but it made sense to roll them in now because ultimately we would, we would want to later. And, and they, to roll them in later would be a, a lower geo bond that doesn't make sense to, to go through the whole, the whole process. Again, the, the, the concept that I need the finance to, committee to understand is from Carol's presentation, we're trying to, we're trying to buffer the increase in levy, in, in levy um, expense, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Marcus and then Bert. Thank you. Uh, so uh, this question's probably best answered by Todd. Um, are you trying to hold the our ability to not raise taxes anymore while still getting all of the uh, 
operational expenses through and paying this additional debt, and that's why you want to spend $136,000 today to spread that out over the next couple of years? I think that's a two-part question. Am I trying to hold taxes? I think the city always tries to hold taxes, but we also have to be realistic that taxes are going to continue to go up because if we don't raise taxes, we're not gonna be able to cover operating costs year over year. Um, and I think our tax, our constituents understand that costs do go, do go up. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to um, minimize the, ex the cost against our operating budget because our, our costs are going up faster than our taxes are, if, if that would be a better way for you to understand. Our revenues are not going up as fast as our costs are. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to balance our, our costs so that our operating budgets can, can afford it without having to make um, reductions in service because the reductions in service is not going to be, that's a slippery slide. Does, it, does that help you? I got a follow up. Okay. I, thank you. Um, so I was always under the impression that the debt here didn't um, didn't apply to the amount that we could raise taxes if we needed to according to the state statutes. Is that correct or not correct? It's not correct. There's a difference between the two subject matters that we're talking about. We have our debt that um, comes ag goes against our, our, our operating cost, our levy, but then there's our operating cost, so we have to be careful with that, but we have our revenue. Revenue is a little bit different. Um, we also have the fact that we have our net new construction and our expenditure restraint that the, the state and, and government hold us to. Um, as an example, when we did our net new construction last year, we should have gone up 26 cents to the per thousand versus 15 cents. The problem that you have is because we only went up 15 cents, our operating income only went up that much. So that means that we gave up some of the um, levy to be able to pay for bills and pay for our overhead costs. If we continue to do that, Obviously, our, our costs continue to go up, and that means that we're not gonna be able to borrow money for capital improvements or road construction or facilities, and it also means that we're not gonna have money to pay for our, our overhead costs, and our, our um, wages and benefits. And we have to remember um, respectfully that we are a service industry, so the, the majority of our cost will be um, wages and benefits because of this, the services that we provide. Does that help you? <laughs> Not so much. <laughs> We're getting into a rabbit hole here. Okay, um, so um, Bert, you have a question and then I think we do need to kind of move on. Okay. Um, go ahead. Okay. I, I, it's actually two parts. I have heard the term operating costs. Is that day-to-day -day expenses that the city has aside from capital improvements? Is that what you say when you say operating costs and that's, a, that's back to our levy? When I, look at the, when I look at the annual budget, I look at operating costs, everything that is coming out of our, out of the revenues that we have. So. Um, we have our wages and benefits, yes, but if you, if you look back at what Carol was showing us, we have our, our geo debt that comes out of our levy. So what we don't want to get into, and, and, the, and we can sidebar this and, and talk about this further later, what we don't want to do is give all of our operating costs, our, the amount that we, can, that we, we use from the levy, our general fund, we don't want it to all be going to, to pay our debt because there's wages and benefits, there's, you know, each department yeah. has their budgets so, kind of concept. Okay, let me interrupt. When you say operating costs, do you include the GO debt? Yes. The, the payment?
payment on the geo debt is included in operating costs when you say operating costs? Yes. Thank you. And then my second question is, uh, when we get to uh, the parentheses on this table, does that affect our bond rating? Will this affect our bond rating? The parentheses that you're seeing in those years, if you look at what the effect of that is, okay, that this schedule tells you the effect of those parentheses. So in the year 2028, you look at the year 2028 on this schedule and you go to the far right hand side. Yep. You will see that your levy, your your tax levy, going from 4.6 the year before to 4.491. Right. Okay. So what this demonstrates to the rating agencies is the city's ability to issue debt as it has in the past as 10 year notes on a capital improvement plan of, at this point, approximately $4 million a year and stabilize the tax levy so that you have a declining tax tax levy. So that is that is a positive thing. If you did not do it, you go back to page two and you look at that same year, right? And, and yep. that year is in the 4.1 which is favorable, but look at what's happening in the years uh, above it. If, right. the, if the levels above it are acceptable in terms of a levy, then then you would not need to refinance, okay? It really comes down to where how you want to manage your levy and what is acceptable in terms of a tax levy for your debt. But in terms of to the rating agency, they would look at the page four, and, and in the years where you see the negative, because that's where you're now filling in debt that you didn't have filled in there before. And this would be the impact of all of that uh, exercise of putting debt in there and adding it to a future uh, CIP. So Carol, would okay. you, would Carol, so, would you agree that our pl the plan, the way we have presented it, would show um, Moody's that we're actually being, um, very good at our our future endeavors? I think what, what we would be showing to Moody's is the fact that the city um, is taking on all of this capital improvement borrowing with, uh, within 10 years and has call features on it for the purpose of making decisions as it goes into its future capital borrowing uh, because at the time you're you're doing your financing, like now, we could be talking about three million. We could be talking about four million, or something um, totally unrelated going forward. But having a plan is what's important to the rating agency. Is how are you planning for your future? And the fact that you in doing all of your advertising, all of your borrowings within ten years, it's not unreasonable to say at some point that the project that you're borrowing for certainly can be amortized over a longer period of time in terms of useful life. But this is just a one-time uh, approach to manage that levy and having a plan to manage your levy. So I think that you know it's all about what's your plan when it comes to a rating agency. And I think that you know we have a very good story. Thank okay. you. Okay, um, I think we really need to move along. I see that we have two possibilities here. One is that we can uh, bring forth a motion uh, to uh, uh, bring this forward to the council at our March 1st meeting. The second thing we can do is explore whether or not we want to talk about this more. My sense is that will interfere with the plan that Carol has put together here. So I think um, I, I just need uh, to uh, briefly, because we have another agenda item that's gonna take some time, um, we, it, quite frankly, I think that this is a new concept for us. And Carol, I always appreciate your uh, explanations, um, but I think that the material is quite dense and yes. is counterintuitive. So um, I, um, uh, committee members and Todd, let me ask you first, um, what harm do you see in us perhaps getting a more simplified 
a description of what this is and um, taking a little bit more time or is time of the essence and we really need to move forward? I, I believe I'd have to ask Carol if, if this can hold over for additional discussion. Um, the, I guess, you know, it's, prop, it's potentially partially my fault that we've muddied the waters because I was the one that asked Carol to present um, more of a model where we looked at four million as a potential spend year over year for the next couple of years, trying to show the committee that we are being, um, you know, strategically planning for future gr um, spends in the in the upcoming years and how this would be affecting us, um, because I think that that's something that we all need to better understand. Um, I agree that the geo debts that we've been looking at in the past couple of years has been what I call WYSIWYG uh, because of the interest rates being uh, as they have been, where we've been able to save very easily uh, year over year. So I can only ask that the committee um, respect the program that we put forward, but if Carol, if, if you feel that we can wait several weeks um, for them to, to go through this again, uh, I guess I, I need your guidance on that, Carol. Sure. Well, if, if we were to wait, uh, the, the presentation to now, tonight would allow us to stay on the same timeline as the city's uh, capital improvement borrowing, so that everything would be in the same rating process, same official statement. Uh, but if we were to uh, wait a couple of weeks uh, to review this more, uh, Financing can still take place. It would just take place as its own on its own separate timeline, uh, with its own separate official statement. Uh, the rating process would be very short, um, but uh, and that's really what would happen between uh, moving forward with it on this timeline. If we didn't, then we would be talking about a separate debt issuance, of whatever you know uh, that becomes um, you know the timeline that is, is comfortable and answers all the questions. Okay, so at this point, I am willing to um, uh, uh, move forward uh, just uh, as a committee member. Um, and I think what I'm going to do is ask for a motion uh, to uh, authorize the city to issue sale of approximately 3660000 in taxable bonds. And let's see if there is someone willing to make that motion and a second, and uh, then we can further discuss it or just see where we're going. So do I have such a motion? I'd make the motion. And is there a second? I'll second that. All right, thank you. Um, my position at this point is that I am comfortable going forward. I'm beginning to understand a little bit better. Um, you know exactly what we're looking at here, uh, but uh, let me hear from other committee members. Let me start with you, Marcus. Uh, I uh, have some concerns with the um, with with spending three hundred thousand dollars in the future, so we can spend an additional one hundred and thirty thousand dollars today, so that we can balance the debt for the next 10 years. It, it doesn't seem like it's a smart move um, and I'm really struggling with with the explanation I got tonight. So I don't think I can support this. Jim? You're Jim, muted. You're, Jim, you have to unmute yourself. Sorry about that. I was having a cough before. Todd, I'm not going to make my remarks as anything derogatory towards you. You've only been on this job now since last July. And, and I know over the next year or two, you're going to look for every possible efficiency of a better way of doing things for all of the departments. To me, though, to me, by doing this, we're taking our, we're, 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 I, I guess we're excusing ourselves for additional, you know, we're saving we're saving on, you know, these costs, but, uh, you know, I guess we're, it, it gives us, uh, uh, I guess I'm trying to say is that it, it, it just gives us, uh, 
another excuse to continue spending money the way we have been in all the various departments, and I'm uncomfortable with that. And again, you're new to this job, and I know your, your evaluation of all of the departments going forward, you're going to look for every last dollar in efficiencies and a different way of doing things. But I'm somewhat uncomfortable with this for that reason. Trey, is there anything you'd like to add? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm not particularly comfortable either. I share a lot of the thoughts that have been communicated by the other council members. That's why I've been rather quiet. I'm trying to absorb all the information in front of me and make sure it makes perfect sense, which there is a picture being painted, but it's perhaps not 100% there yet. I, the biggest thing for me is if we could get a short, clear uh, A to Z explanation at the full council meeting if this moves on to that of exactly what's going to happen, what the future implications are, what they are if we don't do this, uh, that would be appreciated. Okay, thank you. Bert? Um, I am I am in favor of this. Um, my 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 caveat is this is a whole big elephant to swallow, and we never got small pieces along the way, and I don't like that no matter where I am. However, I understand the concept of advanced refunding. Um, the fact that interest rates are so low right now makes a lot of things. Uh, very palatable because of the interest rates. Among them are the differential and the taxable and the non-taxable. I also appreciate leveling out um, the operational expenses against the tax levy versus the geo debt. Um, it, it appears as if it would not uh, uh, bother our round, ground, uh, bond ratings. Uh, significantly decrease our bond ratings. So um, I, I think the forward planning of this is probably very prudent. However, I, I think the lesson to be learned here is you can't just bring an elephant on a committee. You just can't keep doing it. So um, I would still vote in favor of this. Um, and I guess I question the prudence of taking of discussing this in full council if we can't digest it as a committee. My other concern is it does make sense to wrap this with the other debt because it's less expensive if we go to market once for all the bonding. But again, if this was in process, you, you just got to give us more ramp up time. So I'd still vote for it. Chair. All right. Chair? Um, in the interest of, yes. I just wanted to make ahead, one Tom. real quick question just to help everybody. Please understand that there were several geo debts in the past couple of years, um, and Mary Lynn, you probably remember these, and, um, and Jim, uh, that we took interest, we, we made interest only so, um, payments, so we borrowed interest ahead of time um, for different areas that we were, you know, like TIDs and things like that. So we, we borrowed money just to make interest only. So if that was palatable, I don't quite understand and maybe I need to work on our presentation moving forward. But the rabbit hole that we kind of fell in is the fact that what I asked Carol to present was the, the ability to look at the next couple of years of CIP at the $4 million amount and how it would affect us. It's just a model. That's why we're doing what we're doing is to allow us to better level our costs for the city so that we have a better ability to afford it year over year. We're going into some troubled times and I'm asking the committee to support this because it's balancing and leveling our debt going forward. Thank you. So, um, I. I think uh, I, I'm going to ask, unless there are any other comments, I'm going to ask for, um, uh, did I get a motion? 
Yeah. All right. Um, and um, we can, um, at this point, I'm going to ask for a vote. Um, it, it can still, uh, I think I'm correct, Chuck, proceed to council even with a negative vote. And there might be an opportunity to, um, uh, to slice up the elephant, to use uh, Bert's uh, analogy, in such a way that um, it is a little bit more uh, comprehensible for all of us. So uh, with that in mind, uh, would all those in favor of the motion please state aye. 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 I have two ayes. Uh, all those opposed? Nay. Nay. All right, and the chair votes aye. So we have a 3-2 vote. Um, and what I would suggest is that, and I don't know just how uh, chunky our agenda is going to be on, on, on uh, uh, March 1st, but um, if we can um, have perhaps, and Todd, you and I can work on this, um, uh, 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 perhaps just a clear presentation of what's going on. Um, because it is a new concept for uh, all of us, and um, and we'll take it from there. How's that? Everyone okay with that? Yes. Okay. Very good. Um, so I am going to go back to um, 3.5, which I had mixed up previously. Boy, it's just not a good day for me. Uh, this is a resolution approving the investment policy for the city of Sheboygan. Todd, do you want to go ahead with that? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, 3.5 is brought forward to, for the committee to review. Um, in, in assisting Daniela and the finance department, I took over the comptroller uh, responsibilities. And in doing so, it was brought to my attention that the policy that we had in place, our investment policy, dated back to 1995. And for those of you in, um, in attendance, I think that's a very, 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 very old program and policy. And so the first thing that I did was uh, get uh, Chuck and, and Thomas involved so that we could update it. And in meeting with our investment groups, uh, we started to look at um, what do we need to do as far as with the economy the way it is? And I'm asking that we follow state statutes and as the policy is written, um, it gives us the ability to um, expand if needed. Again, it's an as needed per, uh, policy, but it gives us more uh, flexibility to, in the market to, to find ways to make the, make the city some money in a, during an economic downturn. So I'm hoping to get support in this. Um, it has been vetted significantly and it fits um, what our, our banking organization and our, our bonding um, association uh, feel is needed to be um, economically viable in, in, a, in a poor situation like we are today. If you have questions, okay, let me know. Questions for Todd, or Thomas, or Chuck, whoever is going to be taking them. Marcus. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just want to know: Is there any risk of us losing money with any of these programs? <laughs> We've been losing money since the economy went down. Um, so please understand that when interest rates go down, the um, ability to make money in the market goes down. So again. They can call it when the interest rates drop, they can call it and cause us to lose investment, but we need the ability to be flexible with whom we, um, who we're bonding with, who we're, who we're working with, and uh, the length of term that we can go out. So obviously right now in the market, as you guys probably know, if you can go out further, you, there is risk that you're tying money up, but there's risk, um, staying in a short market because there's seriously there's no money to be made um, in the in a short-term market right now uh, and we're talking I mean if if we can borrow money at less than a percent the interest the ability to make money in, in a in a poor market like this is less than a percent so again this is looking at state statutes it's also looking at um, you know where we were in 1995, which is a lot different than where we are in 
2021. Again, it's, these, it's a policy for us to follow and manage um, the investments that we have. Chairperson Donahue, can I, can I add to that? Thank you. Sure. Um, you know, we, we are so constrained in state law in what we can invest in in the first place. Uh, we cannot buy GameStop stock, whether we want to or not. Um, so, you know, is, is there the possibility that what we can invest in is uh, goes down? You know, we're basically limited to investing in, in bonds from entities that look like us. Um, is there the possibility that we invest in a bondholder that doesn't pay what you know, doesn't make their payment? I mean, that that's always a possibility. Um, you know, at any time, any time you don't stick money in your mattress, there's a possibility someone doesn't make the payment they're supposed to, or the bank uh, folds, or you know, any of the any of the things that can theoretically happen. And if you stick your money in your mattress, it's possible your house burns down. So, you know, there, there's sort of risk regardless of which, which direction you go. But as state law very much constrains how much risk we can take on, even if we wanted to um, be very, very risk accepted in that investment policy. All right, Bert? Um, I don't see very much reason for us to be more conservative than the state of Wisconsin is. So, um, <laughs> I am, I am quite willing to match their criteria. Um, I also think that um, having, a poli having an investment policy from 1995 is very offensive. So we should do something about it because it, we should review it every five years, minimally. So um, I would move that we adopt the investment policy as proposed. Very good. Second. Is there a second? Second. All right. Any other discussion? I have a question for Thomas. Uh, Thomas, I'm I'm reading here that we're you know that I guess the the maximum we can have at a bank is FDIC, so that would be what two hundred and twenty five thousand would be the max per financial institution. Two fifty. And then the other the other can you go into the statutes a little bit of exactly what we are allowed to invest in? I presume it would be CDs. What, what else does the state allow? Absolutely. Um, so I believe FDIC limits are 250. I believe it's $250,000. Yeah, it's okay, 250. It's 250. What, what we, yep. Okay. And, and what we've done in the, uh, in the investment portfolio or in the, uh, in the investment procedure is we talk about keeping the average balance within that FDIC insurance limit. So, you know, when, when we're making payroll, you can end up with a lot of money moving in and out as we're trying to make sure that you know, our checks don't bounce when uh, a lot of the things that the city buys as an institution are quite expensive. Um, and it's not, it's not unheard of for us to be writing a check for more than $250,000. So what we're, what we're trying to talk about is the average, uh, sort of the average daily balance, keeping it within that insurance limit recognizing there's going to be a day or two here or there. I mean, we're, we're significantly higher than that as we've got to set up for those, uh, for those things. One thing the finance department has done is they've gone to monthly check runs. So again, you know, when, when you're setting up to, uh, to pro batch process those checks, th there is more exposure there, but you're, you're also limiting the, the amount of time uh, that you are so exposed. Let me pull up the uh, the relevant state statute on. Uh, That's okay, on Tommy. We believe you. Okay. <laughs> uh, Unless somebody else doesn't, <laughs> but I'm an hour away for my six o'clock. So, ba so basically, it, basically, it's CDs of different duration, then, right? It, it's CDs. It's other municipal bonds. It's things of that sort. You can invest in uh, in U.S. Treasury bonds. You can invest okay. in the local government, uh, Wisconsin local government investment pool. Um, the the one restriction that we put on ourselves, which is I suppose more conservative than the state, the state will let you invest in uh, municipal bonds that are the highest or second highest rating category. And we've said we think the highest is is enough. So balancing that that interest rate return and that risk. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Any further discussion? Chair. Hearing none. All in favor, state aye. Aye. Hey, Tom, did you want to say something? I'm sorry. I, I, 
Yeah, I was just gonna add that this policy is for all of our investments. Um, presently, we, we have investments through Wisconsin Bank and Trust, where I move money almost daily for, for operating costs. Um, as Thomas alluded to, the, we do have one other investment firm that we use, and I just wanted the committee to understand that that firm did not have an actual investment policy from the city of Sheboygan. So again, this is one of those urgent items that um, I've tripped over that needed to be updated. So I appreciate their support. All right, if there's no further discussion. All in favor state aye. 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 <coughs> Chair votes aye. Uh, before there's a motion to adjourn, I just want to extend, and I think I can do this on behalf of the committee, Todd, our deep gratitude for the energy and the um, imagination is not exactly the word I would use, the innovation and the innovation perspective that you are bringing to the job to solve and address problems that probably haven't been solved and addressed maybe even before 1995. So our action tonight um, is not a reflection at all, I think I can speak for all committee members here, um, uh, of your uh, willingness to uh, really take hard looks and be very energetic about uh, representing not only the best financial interests of the city, but all the other things that we do, which is, is pretty complex and extremely important. So with that, um, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Chair votes aye. Thank you all. Um, what a meeting. <laughs> Stand up now and walk around before you get into your next meeting. <laughs> Thanks all. Good night. Good night. I see you got your vaccination I badge. Did. Yeah, we got our second one last Tuesday. Did you get your second or first? This is my first and I'm so excited. Oh yeah, we got our final one last Tuesday. It went pretty well. Yeah, a little, a little run down the next day, but otherwise, no problem. Yeah, great. Well, we're just excited, and I'm ready to book my.